First of all, has everyone got a Chupa Chup? Where are the bags of Chupa Chups? Yay, thank you. Ask and you shall receive. Okay, has everyone now got a Chupa Chup who wants one? That's great. No, no, because we're going to do something else in a minute. But, <laughs> but sustainable pace, you know. Human ops and all that. Great, how are we doing? Lovely. There we go. All right. Yeah, all good? All right, basic Chupa Chups needs address. I believe, Jorge, you said it's the Spanish. Spanish yes. invention. Yes. Goodness me, Spanish. <laughs> so fun. Right. Um, quick show of hands. Who here has heard me speak before? Just... Okay, I'm going to see how... I hope, I'm hoping to surprise you at the very least. So if you can all stand up. So today we're going to talk about play at work, harnessing human potential through play. So obviously there'll be some of that. Um, before we start, it's really important that we warm up because we don't want to pull anything. So if you can just copy me, if you can just sort of slowly turn your head around, it doesn't matter which direction. Just turn. Yeah, did you know that the head, the human head is the, the heaviest bit of you and then go the other way, just slowly. There you go. And then maybe just kind of stick your arms out in front of you without punching the people in front of you. Just sort of twist your wrists around. Excellent. And then just, you know, hands on your hips and kind of just do a little, there we go. See, it's Thursday night. You see just the things you get in, in the human art space. Okay, so when you're ready, you might want to take your lollipops out and just pop them behind your ear. Uh, when you're ready, follow me. All good? One, two, three. Head, shoulders, knees and toes, knees and toes. Head, shoulders, knees and toes, knees and toes, and eyes and ears and mouth and nose. Head, shoulders, knees and toes, knees and toes. Faster. Head, shoulders, knees and toes, knees and toes. Head, shoulders, knees and toes, knees and toes, and eyes and ears and mouth and nose. Head, shoulders, knees and toes, knees and toes. Well done. Grab a seat. Bravo. So I, I dare to guess that that is the first time that has been done at BFT. Is that correct, Victoria? <laughs> Excellent. So, next bit of play. I'd like you to turn to your neighbor, um, introduce yourself or find someone you don't already know, um, and share with them the answer to, if you were a superhero, who would you be and why? Give you 60 seconds. Go. Okay, so um, who'd like to share? <laughs> I'd be Invisible Man, so In I could spy on everyone. Invisible Man, so you can spy on everyone. I'd be able to fly because he doesn't want to fly. And be able to fly as well. The Invisible Flying Man. Okay, great, thank you. Who's next? <laughs> Please. I am man, clever, infinite money, pretty much do anything. <laughs> Did we have one here at the front? Superman, you can kick everyone's ass. Super <laughs> so it's Superman because he can kick everyone's ass. Okay, let's do one more. One more super. This, you are the spaghetti monster. The flying spaghetti. What is that? Does that actually? Oh, wonderful, wonderful. You use the thing called imagination, um, which takes me nicely to uh, just a quick intro on who I am. So if I were a superhero, I would be the fairy godmother, completely made up, um, because my superpower is in seeing the human potential in everyone I meet. 
And that just makes me itch, because I'm thinking, oh, there's so much potential here. How do we harness it? It would be really you know, fun and, and valuable to the world. So that's my superpower. Uh, I work as an agile coach. I'm a storyteller. And more recently, um, I created a personal social experiment called the School of Play. So I'd like to tell you a little bit more about that towards the end. Um, and also, I am the author of uh, The Craziest Thing. It's the first ever Choose Your Own Adventure book on Agile, where you play an Agile coach. Um, and you have five days to turn around a team that works in a dating company, of all things. Anyway, a bit of fun. So without a goal, it's hard to score. So let's look at the user story for today. Um, the title is Harness Play Potential. As a play seeker or play skeptic, you choose. I need to harness play potential so that we can improve individual and team performance and happiness. So hopefully all the tests will pass at the end of the session. We will test. One, I have a basic understanding of play. Two, I can explain the importance of play at work, especially to your boss tomorrow. Three, I have one or more ideas to try myself, because change begins with ourselves. And last but not oh, uh, four, I have one or more ideas to try back at work. And last but not least, I've had fun. Right, are you ready to play? Hooray, always. So Plato once said, you can discover more about a person in an hour of play than in a year of conversation. If you agree with the statement, raise your hand. Okay. Well, let's test that, right? Because we've got almost an hour um, this evening. Now, the key thing to know about play is what they call, it's what they call a subconscious <coughs> imaginary I number activity. So for most of us in this room, we will struggle to understand that because with our minds, we understand what is conscious, what is a real number, right? So our number is structured conscious thinking, struggle, right, with thinking about the I stuff, right? All of the ma mathematicians know this. But what I would like you to do is just kind of step away from what you know and really try to experience this session and see how you feel throughout and maybe even after. So, pop quiz, when was the last time you played at work? See so if you can all stand up. Okay, if you played in the last month at work, stay standing. Indeed. So define play was a question here. If you found it playful and fun, you can stay standing. And if you played in last month. Okay, if you played in the last week at work, stay standing. Otherwise, please sit. And if you played just before you came here this evening, please stay standing. OK, fantastic. Now have a good, good look around at who's still standing. Right, These are the people you want to be net networking with and getting tips <laughs> in the break. Fantastic, thank you. That's probably the highest ratio of uh, players I've seen. So now that we've tested your play frequency, let's look at what I call your play preference. Now the key thing to remember is this is simply a preference. And depending on the context, whether or not you're at work, at home, somewhere else, that will change. But I would like you to have a think about what your preference is right, at work. So along the x-axis is desire from low to high, so desire to play. And along the y-axis is the know-how. Okay. So um, type ones are those who can play and they want to play. Yeah. Type twos can't play, so they're not quite sure how to do it at work, but they certainly want to. And they're the ones that kind of come over to your desk when they hear a little bit of ruckus and they, they see the sweets come out and you know they know there's fun to be had. Then there are the type threes. They're the, oh, I can play, but I won't play. I, 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 you know, I ace it all the time down the golf club on a Saturday and Sunday, but really I'm very career minded. I'm here to do work. You know, I'm here to excel my career. And then you have the type fours. Now they're the can't plays and the won't plays. The key thing here is that not only have they forgotten how to play, it's possible that they never learned how to play in the first place. That is really sad. Yeah, and I'll come back to that. Now you laugh, but actually play, like so many of these things that we assume you should be able to do, can also be a skill, right? And that changes the game when something is a skill, because it means you can learn it, you can reproduce it, and then you can rock the world. So, pop quiz. What's the opposite of play? Have a think about that. Now, I'm going to give you a tip. It's not work. <laughs> so in play, it leads to creativity and innovation, as well as invention and growth. 
What about work? Well, work also leads to creative and, and innovation. It can lead to purpose. Can you imagine? Purposeful work, crikey. And of course, competence, so mastery, which Diane Pink talks about. So I ask again, what is the opposite of play? So imagine a world where there are no movies, no music, no jokes, no risk-taking, no fantasies. What are we left with? Silence. Silence? Anything else? Boringness. Bo <laughs> boringness. I love that. Boringness. We should have that to the dictionary. Hang on. Got one there in the back. Countryside. Countryside. <laughs> Harsh. Oh, goodness. Uh, there was one. Isolation. Isolation. I'll give you one more. Come on. One more guess. Ooh. <laughs> Something ishin. Isol what was Sorry, I missed that. Conversation. Conversation. Was there one? Writing documentation. Writing documentation that no one reads. Uh, was there one more? Was it Harry? Was Sadness. It? Sadness. Okay, so we're warming up to it. Turns out it's depression. Um, and this is based on the findings of Dr. Stuart Brown, who wrote a book on play, and we'll come back to him in a bit. Um, but this was based on years and years of research and observation from working with high-risk, very dangerous prisoners who are murderers and various other people and responsible for massacres. And what he found was that these people um, struggled in life because of an absence of play. So let's map the different types now. And I, I want you to have a think about which, which your play preference type is at work, right? So if you were a type ones at work, if you're type ones, you can play, you want to play, you're in that space, right? You're rocking, you're, you know, you've got creativity coming out of your ears. Um, and if you're type two, well, you know what? You, you kind of, get, you know, get on with it. But nonetheless, you're ready to play. And so you still tap into the creativity and innovation. And of course, you've got the added bonus of purpose and competence. If you're type three, then you're kind of edging near the line, right? That orange line of depression, potentially. And the can't play and won't plays, they're also at risk. So, um, I wanted to demonstrate here what the noise of no play sounds like. Who'd like to hear it? Has anyone ever heard it? Okay. All right. It's, it's only brief. Um, uh, okay. Take a deep breath in. Okay, you ready? So um, that was my three and a half year old. And that was the point at which she realized that play had just come off the table because she had had a nap and it was too late to go and play. And as I saw her, I thought, oh, I have to get this for the talk. Um, but also because whenever I've seen her upset, you know, when you're a child under the age of five, you're so connected with what's important and what's vital to you. You just let it all hang out, don't you? And I don't want to wait until I'm old to wear, sh wear shell suits and let it all hang out then. I want to live it now, right? And did you know that they did research where if you did not play enough between the ages of zero and five and had affectionate touch from your parents as well and cuddles, that your brain could be 20 to 30% smaller than the average human being. So whenever I hear Emma make that noise now, I, I stop and I make time to play, even if I'm going to be late, right? I mean, I try to get a bit more disciplined, and I introduce the notion of time boxing, which she's getting, and she likes post-its. She started scribbling on them, like, great. Well, she can't write yet, but you know. There you go. Turn it into a game. So here's some more research on um, depression and actually burnout. So when we're running on empty, uh, this is the exhaustion funnel, right? So we see you get sleep problems, you lack energy, yeah, you get aches and pains. It's a really bad spiral. You feel guilty, right, for various reasons. You feel a sense of joylessness, and you get into a depressed mood, and you feel exhausted all the time. And as we know, that's partly why, and mainly why, the human ops movement has now sort of grabbed hold of our attention, right? And for the first time this year, I, um, this year I was track host um, of the Agile track at QCon, right? But it was remarkable to hear, you know, a speaker come up and talk about depression and the problem we've got in the DevOps IT space, because people are working themselves, not just to death, right? But they feel guilty about not doing enough. How can that be right? 
And if we look at just sickness that's impacting the business, you want numbers, you want the cost of this stuff, 131 million days were lost due to sickness in the UK. All right? Just can't make it to work anymore. Are you really genuinely sick as well? Uh, musculoskeletal problems, 30.6 million days lost. Crikey. Mental health problems as well. Um, and I've included here the burnout questionnaire, which I'd encourage you to just have a go to take when um, you download the presentation. It's very interesting. It's only, you know, about 12 questions just to see where you are. Yeah. And it's a useful conversation to start up with your team. Because isn't it about time that we stopped the small talk at work and really did the big talk? So on that depressing note, I'd like you to stand up again. OK. So I just so stick your hands up. And we're just going to shake, right? Shake it all out. Come on. Now, I've been reassured by my yoga guru that we do this to get the blood flowing, right? And we can just do a little kind of circle around one way, the other way. And she assures me that her guru, who gets the entire UN doing this, that it just really kind of not only uplifts your mood, right, but just gets your blood flowing. Yeah. OK, right, great. Are we all good? Just shake it up a bit more. So, oh, got the head roll there. Yeah, nice one. OK. <sighs> Grab a seat. So now let's take a little bit more about what really play is. OK, how many squares? You may turn to your neighbor uh, to, to discuss this. Uh, let me just give you some options. How many squares do you see? Is it, one, is it A, 17, B, 26, C, 30, or D, none of the above? You have 60 seconds to uh, either think about it yourself or discuss with your neighbor. Go. Okay, let's do a show of hands. If you think it's A17, raise your hand. If you think it's B26, um, it's raise your hand. Okay. If you think it's C30, raise your hand. And if you think it's D, none of the above, raise your hand. Okay, let's hear from uh, the none of the above. Some ideas of what, why you selected that. Yes, please. Okay, you think it's 27? Okay, who here thinks it's 27? Okay. Any other reasons for none of the above? Uh, 29. 29? And it's not 17, okay. You don't think they're really squares? <laughs> Crikey, I forget which crowd I'm in front of. Wow, you know, that's a visual uh, <laughs> testing. Excellent. One more. 31. Th 32, 31. OK, so this exercise is to demonstrate it all depends on what you mean by a square. So for the mathematicians amongst us, um, apparently, that is absolutely pivotal to your answer. And this is an example of creative thinking and creative problem solving. Right, because without defining what we mean by something, we can have a multitude of question answers, and we could all be right, couldn't we? Okay. So, what is play? So, Dr. Stuart Brown is the uh, medical doctor that did the research um, and observed that the prisoners um, and the and and the criminals um, had a play deficiency, and he describes play as seemingly purposeless. So it's really important to emphasize seemingly purposeless. It's voluntary, because otherwise it would be punishment. It's inherently attractive. So when you see other people playing, you'll naturally be interested. Um, a good way to test this is when you're on the tube and you see children or other adults playing. You know, you naturally get intrigued. Um, time flies by when you're having fun, doesn't it? And of course, it reduces your sense of self-consciousness. So you really kind of let yourself emerge rather than worry about, you know, oh, does my hair look good in this? You know, you, you know uh, oh, God, what are they thinking of me? Or what should I say? What should I do? 
And of course, there's a potential for improvisation. So improv is so good uh, for your brain. And of course, it's a desire to keep going, right? And that's what keeps us growing. Incidentally, um, Dr. S uh, Stuart Brown actually struggled to get funding to do his research on play because people didn't take it seriously enough. Isn't that interesting? So why play? And these are reasons you probably know, right? But it's really important to talk about them. Um, so all psychologists and various scientists all agree, and they rarely do, um, that it shapes an organism's brain. It makes animals smarter and more adaptable. It enables us to sustain social relationships. It fuels creativity and innovation. And what's more, research has shown, they did the poor lab rats, right? So they took um, some uh, rats, two groups. Uh, one group of rats, they allowed to play. Goodness, don't, I, I, don't ask me how they knew this. But one group played, and the other group didn't play. And then they let, and then they set out, they set off both lots of rats in a room, and then they let out a cat into the room. What happened next? Any guesses? The ones who played lived and the ones who didn't died. The, pl the ones who played lived, the, the ones who didn't died. Any other suggestions? They decided to play with a cat. The, the RSPC burst in and said, what are you doing? The, the RSPC burst in, thank you, and said, oi, what are you doing? So it turned out there was a, a hole in the room. Um, so uh, both groups of rats scurried into the, the room, um, and then they took the cat out. What happened next after the cat left the room? The miserable uh, rats killed their happy rats. <laughs> 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 wow, we've been w watching it. We have been watching a lot of Walking Dead, haven't we? Okay, so the miserable rats killed the happy rats. We're apocalyptic. Uh, one more guess. One Can more. I just ask, how do rats play? I don't know that. Okay. Yeah, how do rats play? Yes, I, d I don't know that in the research. Yeah. Probably the happy rats came out while the other happy ones stayed in the hole. Oh, the happier rats came out while the other ones stayed in the hole. So it turned out that the rats that played, they eventually sniffed around and sussed out that there was no more danger, and they came out. And the ones that didn't play, they stayed there till the end of their lives in the hole. OK. So let's move on. How can we get our recommended daily amount of play? So it's been such, um, such a thrill and, and shock, really, to be a, a play researcher. So it turns out there's a recommended daily amount of play. And it's between 5 to 10 minutes. And that is enough. For you, I mean, you can have more if you wish. I mean, please do. Uh, don't let me stop you. But five to ten minutes is a minimum, yeah? And apparently that's enough to tide you over for the day. Um, and if you play for one day, it will last you for a week. And we can test this, right? How many people manage to get to work the, the following week after, you know, a weekend? Right? And it's likely because they've played, you know, for about one day's worth over the, you know, Saturday and Sunday. Right? It's really important. And the key thing is to do little and often play. You know, just like you don't want to do binge programming, you don't want to do binge playing, right? You want little and often, you know, smaller batches, higher throughput, all that goodness. So why should adults play? Well, it turns out it's exactly the same reasons why children need it. Why, should, why would we be any different, right? So it breaks down barriers between people. Yeah, it opens the mind to enable learning opens the heart to create a connection because again all of a sudden you just you and you you're gonna have fun and you're getting on with it it's a source of joy and it's a source of hope yeah because when we play there's a chance to win but there's even a greater joy if you can win together right transforms the the way we think so I'd like you to do a quick exercise and um, hopefully you've got a pen and under your seat if you haven't found it already is um, a bit of a doodle sheet. So this is, I mean, apart from coloring and dot to dot, um, who here has heard of uh, Hirameki? So that's the latest form, that's a Japanese name for um, doodling, and they've uh, officialized it, um, and it's called, and Hirameki means in Japanese, a flash of inspiration. So I'd just like to just give you a, a minute or two and look at those doodles and try to make some drawings out of them, okay? And you can switch with your neighbor if you find it uh, difficult with your doodle sheet. Um, but I'll give you guys one minute to have a really good doodle. Go crazy. Ooh. 
make a picture of your doodles. There is no right or wrong. When you've done enough doodling on your sheet, feel free to switch it with someone else. Promiscuous doodling. There we go. Yeah, let's switch a doodle sheet. That's it. Yeah. Yeah, live a little. And go home and tell everyone you did promiscuous doodling this, this evening. And they'll want to doodle with you, right? Okay, let's share. How did that feel? <coughs> Good. Not enough time. What else? How did, compare it to how you feel post doodling and pre doodling. Weird. <laughs> right? Weird is good on a third, Thursday night. <laughs> oh, you're only halfway through. You can feel free to doodle as I talk. Because you know, there's now scientific research to prove that doodling actually it helps you to focus more. Right, and we're going to come back to the different intelligences in a moment. Okay. So um, I'd like us to now take a brief walk down history lane because one of the things I did as a, as a play researcher was I thought, okay, so I think I've sussed it. The reason that people don't play at work, and in fact they don't play in general, is because they feel a bit embarrassed, especially if they have to play with like the two or three-year-old in public. Um, embarrassed, possibly ashamed, maybe vulnerable. So I'm like, okay, I've got my logical ha hat on, that, that's it. But I thought, well, hang on a minute, let's look at the root cause of this, because surely those are emotions, and maybe we learned that from somewhere. So I started dabbling into the history of play, which was very interesting. Let's see if you agree with me. So back in the Middle Ages, play was considered pretty much evil. At best, it was a distraction. Yeah but it was mostly frowned upon. And children were actively prevented from playing because they had to work, presumably to survive. Yeah? That happened for a long, long time. So in the 1700s, uh, John Locke, our English philosopher, um, started the conversation of, you know what, I think corporal punishment, smacking at schools, not a good thing. So he put it out there. Um, and it happened at around the same time that the Archbishop of uh, Canterbury, St. An Anselm, also agreed that this was something worth campaigning for. They saw the value of play in childhood. So in 1783, a remarkable thing happens. Poland is the first country to ban corporal punishment in schools. Hooray to Poland. Amazing, not just the Eurovision. So then, in 1895, three R's. Who here has heard of the three R's and was actually educated, you know, based on, you've got to be really good at the three R's, you know, reading, writing, and arithmetic. Yeah? Yeah? Now, I was born in 1975, and that was also how our, my entire education was based on that. <coughs> and incidentally, um, it was uh, coined, the term was coined by the sun of a sea biscuit manufacturer. So you'd think he'd come up with something better, wouldn't you? Something more playful, but alas, no. And he was uh, actually a member of parliament as well. Finally, in 1916, someone says, okay, well, let's measure intelligence. So then we have IQ. What happens? How many years on, we now still have 70 different versions of how we define intelligence. So it's not just play that defies defining, it's intelligence as well. Right? What is it in the end? 
right? What is IQ that we place so much importance on? 1932, hooray, Lego, right? Yeah, Lego is all about play and the building blocks, right? You only need to watch a two or three year old, give them 12 blocks, what do they do, right? In fact, actually, we don't even need Lego. We need a piece of toast. With my three-year-old, it'll be, oh, mommy, a boat. Oh, a ghost. <coughs> right? How many ideas do they come up with in minutes that we would really struggle with doing? Right? I, I encourage you to do this if you go out to eat tonight and impress your friends. Um, but there's Lego, right? Building blocks of play. So in 1938, um, a Dutch uh, philosopher wrote something called Homo Ludens, which is about the playing man. And he really, again, urged society to take play more seriously because it shaped the way that our civilization was going. And a world without play would be a very sad place indeed. So I was born in 1975, so somewhere around here. And I was really focused on um, achievement, right? You know, I'm, I'm Chinese, I'm a girl, uh, compliance, get it done, get it done well, you know, hurrah. So when I was in 1983, when I came across this idea of multiple intelligence, it changed my world. Because multiple intelligences, apologies, the, the visibility is not very good on the, with the light, is that you actually have at least eight more intelligences than just IQ. There's body, right? So body smart, dancers, people smart, being good with people, word smart, languages, right? Logic smart, techies, geeks, nurture, nature smart. If you have a love of nature and animals, that is an intelligence. Can you believe that? Vets, intelligence. Um, Self-smart, self-awareness is an intelligence. Oh my goodness. So, you, you know, that transformed the way I look at the self-help shelf when I go to the bookstores now, right? Picture smart, being really good at visual representation of things. Of course, music smarts. So where do we go from there? Well, then we invented emotional quotient, which is great because um, then we started really talking about our feelings much more. Um, and in 1991, uh, something was created by the UN um, as a directive called Article 31, and it was the right to play. And it was the right to play for children. And in 2010, Dr. Stuart Brown, uh, working with the prisoners and finding the, the problems with the deficiency of play, um, wrote his book on play. But what was interesting is in 2013, the UN felt that they needed to add a general comment to their actual directive of play for children back in 1991 because the governments weren't taking it seriously enough. And then in 2014, Play IQ came in. Yeah, that's the latest findings, Play IQ, right? Because if thought, right, is considered intelligence, and movement is considered to be play. Well, what is play? Yeah? Isn't play thought and movement together? And that's his um, proposal. And actually, uh, James Finlay, um, uh, the philosopher and researcher behind this, proposes that play intelligence is actually the foundation of all other intelligences. And it's the first brain we ever developed as a human being. Yeah? That's our most childish brain but it's also the brain that we can actually tap into. And it's probably the one that the zombie virus doesn't quite get to yet, right? So we have hope. No spoilers. So, <laughs> what was that? No spoilers. No spoilers. Um, so I'd like you to uh, just take a moment. You've got an index card in front of you, and we're going to play one more game before we go. So here <coughs> is uh, the miracle game. So suppose tonight, while you slept, a miracle happened. When you awake tomorrow, what would be some of the things you would notice that would tell you that your life had suddenly become more playful? So take five minutes and turn to your neighbor and tell them this, and they will write it down for you and then swap, and then you will have this to take away with you, right? I won't give you five, we'll just take a, a couple of minutes, go. You talk and I'll, I'll write. Okay. Yeah. So what would you notice tomorrow? Uh, 
gravity was 50% of what it is today? Gravity? Yeah. 50% of what it is today. Okay, so I would encourage you to hold on to your card. Um, and during the break, uh, we can share that with our, our friends. Um, I'd like to take this opportun opportunity to just give you a, a special piece of information before we go. So in summary, play for your life. Remember that the opposite of play is depression. But that's good news, because now that you know you can play more. Yeah. And play 10 to 15 minutes a day. And of course, there are multiple intelligences, more, much more than the three R's. Develop your play IQ and do play more. So, now, uh, as this bag, as it takes a bag to tell us, um, anyone can be cool, but awesome takes practice. Um, so, I decided my purpose in life um, is to contribute to that history of play timeline. Um, and I've gone and done it. So, I am the founder of the School of Play, dedicated to promoting happier adulthood through lifelong play. Um, I hope that you'll come along. Uh, currently, you know, we've got uh, events running as well, and it's about really understanding what play is. And if some of you go, WTF, that's exactly the point, <coughs> right? Because if we're playing enough, you'd be saying, oh, you know, I've got plenty of play already, you gotta do this, that, and the other, right? But play can be a skill, and it can unblock and realize so many of our dreams. So there'll be a play treasure trove, so have a look at those. Um, just, just do one bit of uh, what, testing here. So, success criteria. If you agree with the following, raise your hand. I have a basic understanding of play. Okay. I can explain the importance of play at work. I, I have one or more ideas to try myself. Yeah, based on your visualizing, perhaps. Uh, I have one or more ideas to try back at work. Could you, any of those kind of carry over, maybe, you know? Go for it. Blame me. And uh, I've had fun. Great. Lovely. Thank you very much for your time. Here we go. Thanks very much for the That's little right. present for oh, you. Lovely. A human ops present. Oh, I've been wanting one of those for ages. Thank help you. Help you to monitor fit. Your, yourself and improve. Wait, what are you saying? What are you doing? <laughs> I know we're friends. The metrics you got of your Fantastic. training. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Thank okay. you.